some that have expired but are still being retained and some that have just been destroyed because you're allowed to destroy them. So consistency will show a certain amount of good faith, reliability also. Um, I'm gonna take some questions. The first question, I'm just gonna read it out. Uh, what's the best practice for an employer if an officer does not seem to be convincing on a spot file audit even if we are 100% compliant? Uh, I think the question you're asking seems to indicate as if an officer is gonna tell you on the spot whether they're satisfied or not. Usually from my experience, that's not the way it works. If you're a larger company or even a smaller company, the officer is likely to take the file with them uh, and then revert with questions that they may have after they've reviewed all the facts and all the documentation. So I don't think that you need to worry about whether they're gonna tell you on the spot whether you're 100% compliant. And my gut feeling is that all of us who are the subject of an audit know when we are compliant or are not compliant. So we will have a sense for it and we've got to work on that. Like the panel has said, we need to prepare for that ahead of time. Uh, trying to remedy the situation is fine, but you want to avoid, that, avoid getting to that spot. Um, and at the end of the day, you will find that once you do get the report, if there are violations, you may be able to use a, your attorneys, a third party professional to help you negotiate that as well. There isn't an absolute of situation because like Satya said, they are going to look to see whether the violations are substantial, whether they were intentional, whether they were inadvertent errors, what is the effort that you made, uh, and what is the good faith effort, not just the effort, but what is the good faith effort that the employer has made to comply with the situation. Um, second question, what are the implications of mistakes in salary detected during site visit? For instance, a wrong salary figure uh, on the H-1B petition. Well, you're clearly gonna to have to certainly either justify the salary and show where the error occurred and why it occurred, uh, or you're certainly gonna get hit with back wages and fines and penalties. And all of you who work in this field should certainly keep your eyes and ears open for immigration decisions that may come out of the Labor Department office uh, under OSHA as well to kind of indicate to you what is the thinking? What is enough or what is not enough? And what are the fines and penalties that are being levied? Another important thing that it's not directly relating to a compliance, uh, but it is in a way, when you terminate an employee, the question often comes up, is it enough to simply terminate the employee without informing the immigration service? And I think we'd all agree, it's very clear at this point in time that you continue to be liable for the employee's salary until you inform the immigration service. It's not enough to simply say, okay, you're done, you're, you're, uh, the termination package and we're all good, you need to withdraw that LCA. Without withdrawing that LCA, you may still leave yourself open to back wages and fines and penalties. Any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, and something to add to just uh, what Rohit said is, and if the employee is coming back, then you must ensure that you pay for that employee to return. So it is the employer's obligation at the same time. If the employee finds another job, it's okay. As long as what Rohit highlighted is, you have informed the USCIS and there is a formal termination of contract between the employee and the employer. So that's very, very important. And if when they see those things are not met, so this is when the, those fines come. And again, depending on the kind of, or the severity of uh, whatever had happened in negative, so there could be debarments. So that can be very, very alarming. So monetary fines, of course, the corporations can pay, but can, if the corporations are debarred to file a non-immigrant visa work petition, maybe for one year, two years, three years, they can debar you doing that. And whatever talking we did from yesterday, seeing that our president designate Trump who is here, mm. so what he can ensure always and he can push that forward is, and he talks about H-1B, and we are talking about H-1B audit. So what the first step would be is just ensure that all the corporations are compliant. So expect more people to knock the door. Earlier it used to be when there was a complaint. So those were the times when they audited. Now it has become random. And in the coming time, my judgment is it is going to be very frequent. So be prepared as Rajesh said, is have a plan. But I will rewrite this process saying, 
here is compliance. Then start with here to meet this compliance. You start a process and to help you out if you need any automation, go for that. We should alarm you that certain breach of compliance is going to happen. So my key for all of us and with next five years with Trump in the office is compliance should be here and the process then should be defined to meet that. I have one quick question for you uh, in line with, in, in keeping with our 500 rupee notes and the 1,000 rupee <laughs> notes uh, situation. Do you want to address any situation that you may uh, think about in terms of black listing, not black money, but black listing? Yes. See, what do investigators do usually is they audit you, and their always intention is to find a breach. And when they find it, it really makes them happy. And when it makes them happy, they want to publish it. And when they want to publish it, they will get kudos for it. Do they have a venue to publish it? Yes. They will put the corporation's name on the website and nobody in this room is going to love that if the name of your company or the corporation appears in that list that is online, anybody can see it, period. So be aware of that so that situation can happen. And the other uh, point I wanted to touch about is it is not that they are just going to talk to employers. They will also be talking to employees. Simple questions like, hey, can you give me your salary slip? Or can you give me your supervisor's telephone number? This question may sound very, what the hell is this question? If the employee working at a client location does not have a supervisor's number, does the employee-employer relation exist? Is the person being even controlled by the supervisor, what we always claim? So these are the simple, simple questions also to the employees. Okay, where did you work last time? Or when did you start working in this position? What is your job title? What was your job title when you started working with the corporation? And what is your job title at the client location? Very simple. And whatever the reality is, it comes very naturally with the employee. And if there is any disconnect there, those are the things they are trying to make a note of it. So also, start engaging with your em employees. I'm not saying coach them to misrepresent something. Because again, misrepresentations are taken very seriously. But if they are aware, if they are more aware, then it helps your cause. Thank you. Uh, just before we wind up, one thought that I'd like to leave you folks with before I ask the panelists for 30 second closing on each, by each of them. All of you are HR professionals and or attorneys. I think it's very important for your own sakes and incumbent on you to make sure that your upper management is kept aware of what is going on. If they are not aware of certain challenges and they're not aware of the processes and you don't have a buy-in from the upper management, it's going to be your neck on the line. You are risking your career, and I just think that that should not be done. You should be consulting with your senior management, making sure that they are on the same page as you are, because that's what's going to help the corporation, and it's going to help you as well. Rajesh, you have 30 seconds. So uh, I think there was one question which talked about, uh, can automation help in terms of managing uh, audit or being prepared for audit? Um, my point is, I think, it both yes and no. Uh, automation will definitely help in terms of managing your uh, regular uh, review or probably a first level of check. And again, depends on what kind of technology or automated system that you have. For example, if I talk about minimum wage, that are really meeting minimum wage, then you need to have the database which has that where what's the LCA is being specified and then look at your payroll data. So both should be connected to kind of see what exactly has been paid to the employee to kind of monitor that. So uh, again, depends on different aspects of immigration compliance that you need to look at. But however, what I would like to say is, while automation can definitely help you the routine manner uh, really stuff, but a physical validation is definitely important uh, for at a periodic level. It could be six months, as Satya said, or it could be one year. If it's six months, again, from external party, it's good for people like us. But it depends <laughs> on the operator of the organization. Thank you. Swati? Um, as Satya said, I think compliance is the goal. 
processes, what we desi design around it to achieve it and automate it to the best so that manual intervention can be reduced. Yeah, I think we've all on the panel tried to give you simply a flavor of the challenges that may present themselves and how you've got to look at it moving ahead. But thank you for attending the session post lunch. Uh, and if you have any other questions, we'll be happy to take them. But thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Himesh, would you like to come for the trophy? Swati?